Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. Uh, this week, we have an exciting show. We're going to go over the uh, Moody Street shutdown, the traffic commission meeting where the fate of Moody Street was decided. We'll talk at length about that. And then we're going to talk about a tenant's rights uh, resolution that uh, made its way back to the city council that did not go the way uh, proponents of tenant's rights would have liked to see it go. Um, we're gonna, And then we're going to talk... Uh, at length about the Municipal Housing Trust Fund, uh, which um, most people don't know exists in Waltham or what it's for. And it did come up recently in the city council meeting and definitely could use uh, some explaining. Um, and at the end, I'm gonna to touch a little bit about the single family zoning uh, ordinance that's been going through the motions and how it ties to um, the affordable housing crisis at universities as well. Um, so this week, uh, we have a full team. We have the usual Josh Castor. Hello, everyone. James Kukelis. Hello, everyone. And we're joined uh, by uh, not strangers, um, but not recurring Eamon Dawes. Hi there, Waltham. And Tom Benedictus. Hello. Um, OK. So we're going to jump into the traffic commission meeting, uh, which happened uh, exactly a week ago. Um, and Eamon is going to tell us how that went, and then we'll chat about it. So this is the uh, latest update sort of on the saga of Moody Street. Um, so the traffic commission met uh, last week to discuss what will be done to Moody Street. So this is April, and many of the proposals have um, something with Moody Street starting in May. So this is kind of the last chance to talk about this. Um, we often think of there being two proposals in front of Moody Street, or, or maybe three. Um, the mayor's proposal, uh, Jonathan Paz's proposal, um, and I guess the third is kind of just to do nothing. Um, but uh, Traffic Commissioner uh, Mike Garvin uh, gave seven proposals with different levels of um, allowing traffic sometimes and different kinds of compromises. Um, and, and I think it was very clear at the meeting that the Traffic Commission is not a uh, legislative body. They aren't here to make policy. Um, they're really here from a public safety perspective. That's why the police chief and the fire chief are on it. Uh, they're here from a sort of municipal works perspective, um, which is why you get the WISE department and CPW. Um, and then you want to make sure that whatever you're doing to the streets is kind of, you know, best practice. Um, uh, Catherine Cagle isn't uh, with Waltham anymore, but you would have someone from the planning department um, and then you would have the traffic engineer. Uh, so, so it's really a, hey, does this proposal for streets um, sort of pass out all of our safety tests? Um, and you could see that I think the body was really struggling um, with the seven proposals in front of them to pick one. Um, it was kind of up to them of if Moody Street would be uh, pedestrianized seven days a week, um, only four days a week, um, you know, or some other hybrid. Um, and I think it put them in a really awkward position. Um, eventually, what they decided was to uh, close Moody Street to cars and have it pedestrianized um, from about 4 p.m. on Thursdays through to 5 a.m. on Monday mornings. Um, so that would start the weekend of um, Memorial Day. So I think the first day would be May 25th, that Thursday. And it would continue to four, for four months um, until September 25th. Um, which I think is the Monday of that weekend. Um, so this is uh, more closely aligned with the mayor's plan of having something only on the weekends where it's pedestrianized. Um, but there's actually a lot of changes um, to what has happened in years previous. Um, so in previous years, the block between uh, Cushing and Chestnut Street was always open for cars. Um, there was only a few restaurants on that street and it was kind of used as a cut through um, for residents and a place where you could park um, if you wanted to do something on Moody Street. Um, but now that too will be closed to traffic um, from Thursday to uh, Thursday evening to first thing Monday morning. Um, also, what that means is that uh, no cars can cut across Moody Street. Um, there was lots of public safety input around that saying that, hey, this is too dangerous. We, you know, Pedestrians don't know that cars might be coming. Um, so if you live on uh, Chestnut Street, you won't be able to cut across. If you live on, um, if, if you ever cut across from uh, Walnut Street over to Cushing, you won't be able to do that anymore. Um, and what that means is that on those streets that are one way that butt up to Moody, 
um, those streets will now be two way and uh, the residents there will lose street parking. Um, I know a lot of the residents there were um, complaining in years past about how um, visitors to Moody Street would use their streets to park, um, but now they don't have any parking anyway. Um, and it's going to be very confusing for them to have, uh, I mean, where they will park uh, normally. Um, also, it's uh, very unclear since this is only something that's happening four days a week, um, you know, how will the traffic patterns change? Um, so, you know, traffic will be allowed to go up and down Moody Street, um, sort of that Monday through Thursday time frame. Um, but on those side streets, will parking be allowed um, Monday through Thursday? Uh, will it still be two way? Uh, a lot of that is, um, at least to me, unclear. Um, another thing that was unclear, but the city recently updated on was around uh, restaurants or other businesses using um, the space in front of their businesses. Um, so, this is something that in years past, um, restaurants have been able to extend into the parking lane and then a bit beyond. Um, but the fire chief said that uh, they sort of need a 24 foot um, space in the middle uh, for emergency access uh, and that it would be um, all week long. Um, I'm not too familiar where that number comes from. I tried searching around, um, but I, I, I'm not quite sure sort of where the rule or regulation is for that. Um, but restaurants who want to use this, uh, the parking lane will be able to um, go back to the traffic commission uh, next month um, and, you know, petition for the use of that space. Um, so they will have, uh, the city will have sort of concrete Jersey barriers put up uh, around the parking spaces and uh, those uh, restaurants will be able to have outdoor dining um, and store some things there. Um, one thing is that even though um, restaurants would be able to have that space in the parking lane all week long. They could only have outdoor dining um, when Moody Street is pedestrianized. Um, so it's only um, around the weekend. Um, so this plan is often, it, it, it's very much a uh, compromise. Um, it's about half time, uh, it's a bit shorter. Um, and I'm interested to see how many uh, if we have all of the same restaurants and businesses um, utilizing the street space as we, they did before, because um, in years past, um, those restaurants may, would be able to use more of the street. Um, they didn't have to have concrete barriers. They could have um, something more attractive um, to uh, you know, just have a nicer dining experience. Um, and also, I will say that I was wrong. Um, I think I was on a few weeks, uh, a month or so ago, um, and saying that the only thing the city has done around Moody Street is um, at the traffic commission. Uh, that is wrong because in years past, uh, they really streamlined the process for licensing uh, because they allowed for all the Moody Street businesses to license for the use of the parking lanes together. Um, so they had a sort of a document of who got which spaces and it was able to uh, just be one item uh, before the traffic commission. Um, but now uh, it'll be every sort of business will have to do it themselves. Um, so that is something that has gone away. It's, it's made it a bit less friendly for uh, businesses to uh, sort of embrace the movie street pedestrianization. Um, so I, I think this will cause um, lots of confusion to uh, folks on side streets, um, anyone who uses Waze or Google Maps to try to navigate through because traffic patterns will keep changing. Um, however, there will be more pedestrianization. There'll be an extra street of it. Um, there'll be fewer cars cutting through um, so it will be something different. Um, I mean, and I'm always excited to see Moody Street pedestrianized. So I'm excited to see what will come from it this summer. And I think that was uh, a very clear synopsis of that meeting. I think you touched on uh, most of the frequently asked questions uh, that people had for this. Um, trying to think of anything logistical before I jump into my thoughts about the meeting. Um, yeah, as a waiter uh, at a restaurant, I, I feel so bad for the wait staff that did not sign up for taking down and putting up a Moody, a pedestrian on the Moody Street restaurant uh, thing. Uh, they're, they're not going to have fun. And yeah, I'll be curious if people just decide not to do it because that's, that's just a lot of work, a lot of money spent. I'm thinking about like Pepino's Dosa that was on the record is spending like 
like what was it like ten thousand dollars on their on their outside equipment and like you know they did it very nice but they're not and they're, they're not going to do that again there's no way one of the biggest things that i did not enjoy from that meeting uh was my friend and secret municipal crush uh joe bizarre um who's also a city clerk um seems to be a big uh opponent of the pedestrian art industry which i didn't enjoy and i let me make sure i, I quote him uh exactly it was a uh, you know, he was talking about if they build it, uh, they will come. We did it for two years and that wasn't the case. He's referring to the daytime hours of uh, Moody Street. He understands that from like five to 10 uh, restaurants are very busy and he sees the need for it there. But besides that, um, he doesn't see the need for a pedestrianized Moody Street. And it's just like, it's like, it's like, does he, does he have a point? Like, yeah, I mean, there wasn't as many cars going through Moody Street as people walking down it at the same time. But but like what I want to make sure people realize is like there was very little effort by the city to do anything with the pedestrianized Moody Street. There was very, very little collaboration between the city of Waltham and like getting people to come to a pedestrianized Moody Street. Like they put, I remember they put like Facebook posts uh uh on there were uh on the city's uh page. But like where was the was a committee on uh, nightlife and pedestrianized Moody Street. That's something they can easily do and, and creative people can come up with solutions. Where is the collaboration with those businesses that were hurt and uh, you know, going out of their way to you know, try and figure out ways that their businesses can thrive? Where was, uh, at the end of the meeting, there, there was a uh, motion to make an RFP to have a consulting firm come in and look at uh, a, uh, building a pedestrianized Moody Street. That was mostly due to uh, the safety concerns that the fire chief brought up, and he wants like uh, someone to really look at this professionally. Um, but it was it was not clear whether they were looking at just the safety concerns or just like a consulting company to look at a plan for pedestrianized street and it just clicked my brain like why didn't we do that three years ago <laughs> like why did we just let the mayor and just like some people that work for the city design this street uh and and then do nothing and then just trust that they had the best idea and then do it again the next year and then we're basically doing it again this year like why why not just hire someone that's done this before why not where was the bringing in people from vermont uh church street or people in salem that have done this before why didn't we bring them in and we can have a conversation with them and not even to mention all of the public seating that there is less public seating now on moody street than there was like five years ago like there was no addition of that there's a, the city did not try very hard to make a pedestrianized moody street thrive and now we're complaining that a pedestrian moody uh, street did not thrive so that is my biggest uh, conundrum there i think joe bizarre uh got it wrong uh there and uh i hope that he sees the error of his ways i think one point around kind of planning and safety considerations is that something that was before the traffic commission was to make this a uh, permanent, um, you know, to stop having this discussion every year um, and to vote on, you know, having this be seasonal. And I, the the fire chief was sort of, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with him in saying this, that if I vote to make this seasonal, I want to make sure that there are, you know, permanent safety improvements um, there, you know, so that if we commit to something, let's commit to it. Um, so I think his uh objection to that is really what spurred on this process for a potential rfp to get a consultant to come in and um have some long-term safety considerations um but so but it seems like until uh the physical streetscape uh changes that we'll still be doing this uh having this conversation every year hmm. those feel like the whole process has kind of been structured to be like death for by a thousand cuts for the entire sort of thing because hmm between the city taking almost no effort to promote it or build anything permanent to continue this or develop anything based on like other what other cities have done it just turns into a situation where it's going to not have as many people as it could and make people upset because of all the traffic and all the dis disruptions that it causes and one of the things that's fascinating too is that i remember from one of the one of the public input sessions there was a person who lived on the street right next to me 
complaining about how he, he was opposed to the pedestrianization, but he was complaining about how people go two ways down the one way street that he lives by. And I can only imagine he'll probably be very annoyed that if the parking gets removed and stuff like that too, for that type of thing, people it, it's, it's, it's interesting how like so much of this is structured to just apparently annoy everyone in every possible way. And the logical outcome of that is going to be sort of rallying support against it, which seems to be sort of the intention of this entire process. Yeah, there definitely were some people using the, the phrasing intentionally bad. I mean, this is really a step backwards in a lot of ways. The mayor like, said that she was going to upset everyone. She said yeah. that it's like intentionally yeah. bad. Now, no one will agree with my plan. And I acknowledge that. No one will agree. But it's my job to try to be fair to everyone. Now, there's a lot of people that aren't here that actually live on the south side that call their councils and call the mayor, but they're not gonna to come to a public meeting. And they have indicated, Mayor, why can't we just go back to the old Modi Street where it's open to everyone? Uh, so yeah, I mean, initially I was like happy that there was something and then like I got like upset when I realized just how not great this plan is. I've like calmed down and I'm kind of excited for like a Thursday thing, but still, it is, this is like very, not a great proposal. It's not a great proposal. Um, and it should it should be also said, and I thought this was so weird, so interesting. Like at the end, they voted and Joe Bizarre made a motion and he was seconded. But the motion was very simple. It was like, we're going to vote to close Moody Street on this date at this time. And it opens uh, at this date of the week until this time. But like, there's so many question marks over what is occurring like there's not it's not it's not it wasn't like they were voting on a plan uh they were voting on a sentence and now it's the traffic engineer and the traffic commission uh their it's their prerogative to interpret that sentence into a whole plan uh and so now there's no voting on it it's just we have to just see what happens with them whatever they decide on and so i'm curious to see how some of those questions get answered. And one thing that we, Tom, were you gonna to say something? Oh no, I just wanted to interject here to say on the subject of the comment earlier, we've talked about how like they said we built it and they didn't come, but they didn't build anything. It should also be said that that's a double standard because while like making Moody Street walkable does like enhance it and make more people uh, come there, you know, it's not gonna magically make it to where people don't go to work and that Moody Street's only going to be bustling during the weekday, like at like 10 a.m. Yeah. But that is a double standard to hold to pedestrianization because hopefully I can track on the pictures and we can insert them right here in this news report. Uh, but there are many photos of like friends of ours who, while they were going to traffic commission, took pictures as they walked down Moody Street when it is fully open to cars. And it is equally barren because the simple fact of the matter is people work and go to school uh, mm -hmm. at 10 a.m. on a Thursday. Uh, and that is a constant truth, regardless of whether there are cars on, uh, allowed on Moody Street or not. And the fact that, that that is not a good standard to hold a pedestrian Moody Street to, whether or not it is a quote unquote ghost town uh, at 10 a.m. on a Thursday, you know? And, and also, um... I think we someone put in the public records request to see the full uh, comments and data from the survey that the city sent out around um, support for pedestrianization. And something like 90% of uh, responders um, wanted a pedestrianization similar to what we had last year. Um, and the traffic commissioner uh, said that any plan that uh, uh, cuts off access uh, from the side streets to Moody, um, he could not um, support, you know, because they would lose all their on-street parking and those streets would have to be two ways and they're very narrow. Um, so I don't exactly know how we got here, but we, we got came with a plan that uh, the mayor herself said is probably going to be unpopular, um, that 90% of sort of the surveyed public disagrees with, and something that the traffic commissioner uh, sorry, not the traffic commissioner, the traffic engineer uh, said that he can't support for, you know, safety reasons for traffic reasons. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know what timeline we're in, but we <laughs> seem to be in one where there's just this crazy decision made that um, 
goes against uh, both best judgment from experts and uh, public will. It's really yeah. crazy how the um, discussion has entirely shifted from like, how are we going to have a six month pedestrianization or whatever to how many days of the week are we going to have a partial pedestrianization? How many hours in a day of a week? It's, it's yeah. insane. It's insane that by every metric available to us, and there are several of them, every single metric that has ever been taken in reviewing Waltham residents' opinions about closing down Moody Street, every single metric has an overwhelming support of shutting down Moody Street. And so, how? yeah, how did we get here? Why? Why aren't we doing it? it, is, it, it Let me, Chris. Can I respond to that? I want to yeah. push back on what. So, because one aspect that hasn't totally been brought up here. So, this has been discussed online a lot, probably more than any other Waltham issue in the past <laughs> couple of years. And there were people who were saying this is a reasonable compromise. And then there were a lot of people who supported a shutdown who said, no, this isn't a compromise because if the restaurants decide this isn't a good deal for them and they don't do it, then it doesn't happen and it, it nothing really happens. So that's not a compromise. The other thing people have pointed out, like Iman did that, 90% of that survey, um, people were in favor of a shutdown. And at the meetings, it seemed like the people were overwhelmingly in favor. But one response I've seen to that, and only a couple people have talked about it online, but I have a feeling a lot of people are thinking about this, is there were some times, even in, in a democracy where, you know, majority rule is not an absolute. Majority rule doesn't always equal fairness. There's some times where the minority has rights that you don't want to trample on. And um, Chris Wangler, in his article about this said can so there were, were certain business owners who were coming in and saying that this is destroying our business you know we have no business if you do this and they seem to be a minority of the businesses on moody however there are a lot of people who feel that if somebody starts a business under in a certain location under certain conditions it's not fair for the community to then change the rules in a way that destroys their business. So they see it as a fairness issue. And I suspect a lot of people, our elected officials and people who work for the city share this opinion because they come from families that ran small businesses. So they relate to this. They, they don't like the idea that the city government could just destroy someone's business. So how do you all respond? How, oh, this is a question to the group. How do you respond to that? Is this maybe a reasonable compromise when you take that aspect of it into account. I'd say that you'd have to uncritically accept first that it's an uncritical good to have cars on the road for their businesses and that it's not something that they are asserting without evidence, despite like all evidence. And I think that, again, because this is, seems like it's set up to upset everyone. Like if people who wanted pedestrianization like we had to say it probably would not have looked like this and if the issue is businesses surviving i don't think anyone who wants pedestrianization wants these businesses to go under as a result as a result of it it's the fact that people who are running the entire show as near as i can tell have it in their minds that cars on the road means that the economy and businesses do well and doesn't isn't going to be swayed on that and as a result, the decisions and all, all the things that lead up to the decisions getting made result in cars being on the road as much as possible, as much as they feel that they can get away with. So and, you're saying the, the belief that it's going to destroy certain businesses is based on an assumption about the value of cars, not based on actual data. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And to further expand on that, they the city is really trying to push, or like the, the opponents of pedestrianization are really trying to push the idea that this is a compromise and therefore it is good and that anyone who doesn't like this plan you know doesn't like compromise and doesn't care about the businesses uh but that is not true because this was not the only compromise this is not the only plan that took business owners interests and wants into account pause's plan i think in a lot more in a much more deliberate way more than just like oh we will allow more cars now took many concrete steps to address the concerns of businesses he promised uh, to set up a, uh, a data collection plan and hire a group of people to look at the data to see how best the businesses can be affected and which businesses are being affected. He put in plans to reduce uh, or eliminate parking costs during the day so that way businesses which relied on business during the day would gain more traffic. Um, and the fact of the matter is like, a compromise is good. Compromise is necessary, I think, to make sure all 
like people are represented. But a good compromise is a compromise which takes everyone's interest into account to make sure everyone is represented and happy. And as has been mentioned in this meeting, as the mayor herself is quoted as saying in the traffic commission uh, public input meeting, as James has mentioned, she acknowledges that this is a plan that makes no one happy. And a plan that makes no one happy is not a good compromise. Compromise is good, but this is not a good compromise plan. Yeah, compromise is good, it, but at the same time, it's also possible to compromise a vote to the point where it no longer floats. And I understand uh, the small businesses that uh, feel like this might hurt their business. Like they're going to do everything in their power to hold on to their money. It's just, it's just, that's just what they're going to say. They're going to say things that they have to say, and they're going to do things they have to do to try and hold on to the money making thing that they have. But also, I'd also like to see the data. Everyone kept talking about that. Everyone talking about I'm losing bit of money. I'm losing business. Like I'd like to see that. I'd like to somebody. So I came into the meeting and said they lost 90, they lose 90% of their business when Money Street shut down. Like that really sucks. That's that's an amazing amount of money to lose. I'd like to see the proof of that. I'd like to you to prove that you lost 90% of your business compared. And, 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 that, it's, you know, and that it's separate from other trends. Yeah, somehow. yeah. I mean, is it that yeah. separate from COVID? Like, what are we talking about that? Or is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about just this shutting down of the street? Because Some people really view carts on the road as back to normal. Yeah. COVID is over. That is what yeah, they if see. You, yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. lost ninety percent of your business because Moody Street shut down, like damn, like you, you should rethink your business model. And also, I'd like to see the proof of that. Yeah, which is not to cast out on that. Like some businesses did lose significant amounts of business, but simply the fact that you know, if you're looking at March 2020 and then April 2020, yeah. <laughs> I talked about the licensing, being able to kind of license all the parking spots together. Um, you know, there's other ways about, you know, can we get people from the, um, you know, lots, city lots up on Lexington Street, you know, get them to get like the TikTok trolley or something to have it easier for them to get down to Moody Street. Um, are there other sort of amenities that the city could put, um, whether it's helping clean up trash to make it a, um, a you know better place for people to walk um you know better amenities in the parking lots to make it easier so I, some things that we didn't do last year that are tangibly have tangible benefits to businesses um but we're not choosing to do any of that i wanted to mention there was also one person in one of these threads who said that the survey doesn't matter because people who really care about their community don't fill out surveys <laughs> they have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with their friend who is on city council or works in city government. There, there is so, there's, there's literal uh, merit to what they're saying, because you know, as, I've, as I've listened to all of this stuff for years and just like paid attention to the community, what I found out is that, that small city politics is about the hundred families that are in power, uh, that have been in the city for decades, conniving, to benefit the 500 families that have all been working together uh, and living together for decades and fuck everybody else. That's just small city politics. And I'm sure that's the same for everywhere else. And so it totally has merit what they're saying. Totally 100%. Well, I, I say this yeah. entirely just to goad our viewers into voting this. <laughs> like there are people who's in a lot of influential people in this town who think that because you're watching, getting your news from channel 781 right now, which is social media, technically, we're not an actual TV show, that you don't deserve, your opinion doesn't matter. If you haven't been here long enough to have a friend you can go have coffee with and convince them of your opinions, you don't matter. So I, I, there, I think there are a lot, this was just a random person on Reddit, but I think it reflects what a lot of people in city government think that all, you know, the, all these people People who don't really matter and that includes us and everyone who's watching this pretty much absolutely no there's there's real merit in what they're saying and it's like they just, it's just like a small majority kind of like a silent majority kind of thing it's that it's that mindset it's like yeah every metric available says that uh we should shut down moody street but me and my friends that have been living here forever they maybe and they own they own a couple small businesses on moody street they don't they don't like it so i'm just gonna disregard everything that's being said and just and just do whatever I want. Just like, do literally whatever I want. Um, speaking of uh, businesses that do support this and don't, Tom, I definitely wanted to let you uh, relive the experience of 
arguing online uh, circa 2023 um, with Waltham Channel. Um, I it's assume Chris Wrangler officially a TV channel yeah. and not your social media. Yeah, yeah. I assume Chris Wrangler runs this uh, YouTube page. I mean, it's Facebook page. It, it just types the way Chris Wrangler talks. But um, but it, and uh, and I'll, I want to just put up um, the the clips of this. Uh, but Tom, if you can explain just the just like the messaging uh, from the city and just the inconsistencies, I guess. Yeah. So as has been mentioned, even though like the vast majority of people support this, you know, decisions are made by like the small minority who don't support pedestrianizing Moody Street, which can be like extrapolated to all other like issues. But what's also interesting is like how this chooses to be reported because, you know, I think Waltham Traffic Commission, Waltham City gathered public input, hoping that would align with what they already wanted to do. And then realizing that it was different, they just ignore it. Because this number we keep on throwing out, the 90% of people who are supporting pedestrianization. The people who actually conducted that study, you know, the Waltham Traffic Commission, Waltham City, the Waltham Ch uh, Channel, the news organization, which helped to like proliferate that survey. None of them have reported on the results of that survey. Uh, they keep on wanting to talk about it as if it is a close, like a closely contested thing, as if it isn't a massive 90% of people support this. And yet in spite of this, the city is going against it. Um, and for those who are curious, 500 people filling out a survey is a significant amount number to like roughly statistically represent the interests of like a 60,000 person community. Like statistically, this is not an unreasonable survey to draw conclusions from. Um, so on uh, the Waltham Channel's article talking about the Moody Street decision, after the public input had happened, uh, they were talking about like, oh, if the, the, if the traffic commission ends up going with Mayor McCarthy's plan, this will shore up her support for the election. And then so I, I replied like, okay, this feels kind of dishonest reporting because how will this shore up her support for the election when this is a decision <laughs> that only 8% or I'm sorry, only 1% of the public supports, you know, eight people in that 500 something person survey supported the mayor's plan. Uh, and almost 500 of them supported, you know, the full regular six months pedestrianization. Uh, and the Waltham Channel responded to me in the Facebook comments, which I thought was very funny. Uh, and specifically they responded to me with data I had never seen before about the numbers of which businesses on Moody Street support and oppose um, pedestrianizing it or shutting it down to cars. And this was data gathered way back in 2021. And roughly the results were like more than half of businesses supported shutting down Blue Street cars. But dividing that further, it ends up being like 90%, over 90% of restaurants and roughly 30% of non-restaurant businesses support it. That's how like the numbers end up working out. Um, and the Walton Channel has shared this data saying, well, we don't wanna draw false conclusions. That's why we excluded this data from the um, from the article we wrote. Uh, and also people said in the public input meeting that they want more data-driven decisions and we wanna respect that. And if that sounds like an incoherent message to share, it is very incoherent. Um, it does nothing to help people to understand the circumstances or how like the public feels about Moody Street shutdown. And it does a lot to disinform the public too. A lot of people, automatically assume like, oh, okay, we chose the weak and only plan. This must be like the public is 50-50. So, <laughs> um, so, so the Walt traffic commission went with the 50-50 decision. Uh, this is something that I got when I was talking to my partner's stepmother about it. This is something I've received a lot when I've been sharing this information on uh, social media. Because once again, the city, Waltham Channel, none, no one has been sharing the results of this public input, except for ourselves and Jonathan Paz. <laughs> and the Globe article mentioned 90%. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so the state, <laughs> yeah, the, the regional media mentioned it as well. That is correct. Thank you. Right. So, so but Chris, Chris Wangler has some kind of standard that's higher than the Boston Globe where he doesn't want to Waltham State Media has opt right? opted not yeah. to cover this. Exactly. Yeah. But we will talk about the in-person public input meeting, which, for those who don't know, is the least representative kind of public input and tends to heavily weight the interest of 
specifically older white male homeowners. Um, but broadly, it's just, you know, people who are old and have free time and have a lot of money. Um, and also, and also think, during that, most majority support still shouldn't have an issue. So. Yeah. Um, but I think the response that sums it up best is just like in Facebook, as I was sharing this data, a response was like, oh, at first I've been thinking that this was a good compromise if there was a lot of people in opposition. But considering that the majority of people want a full shout, shutdown, I don't understand why they went with this opinion. So that's what's that's what the public is starting to think because the city and the Waltham channel is intentionally omitting this public input that they receive. They are giving the false impression that this was like a 50-50 like public support when in fact 90 over like 90% of residents in Waltham were in support of shutting down Moody Street to cars. And and businesses as well by every metric everywhere most people support pedestrian industry. Yeah, if, if, they, if the article wanted to be honest about a win, uh, you know, if it's a win for Jim McCarthy, the, the article should have said like, Jeanette McCarthy shoots herself in the foot by alienating herself from most of her constituents because most of her constituents want a Moody Street shutdown. Just do mm -hmm. it. And you know, I don't know. It's, it's just, that's just Waltham Channel. Yeah. So yeah, I call yeah I called them dishonest in the Facebook comments, and it rang true enough to get a response from them, which I thought was funny. And yeah, I'd never seen that survey either, and so I'm glad I'm glad you did. Um, and we can I guess link that survey uh, in the comments if or we can put it up here for those of you who haven't seen it. Let me just say one more thing about WCAC for those who don't know. WCAC is not part of the city government, it's a nonprofit, but it, the head of the board is Justin Barrett, who's a close ally of the mayor. Um, the reporters there, I think Chris Wangler does a good job on a lot of his stories, but he ha he relies on relationships to get the news. He, he's always the first one to report anything having to do police before any other um, outlet. And in some cases there was uh, when the last year when the police chief was was replaced when the police chief retired waltham channel reported it um the, that was back when the patch and the tribune were still in operation they didn't know about it till later um so i think because he relies on those relationships he is not critical of waltham government he's not critical of the mayor that's not to say his articles aren't nuanced but they never hit the kind of he, he, they don't focus on the issues we focus on that might be more controversial um, from the mayor's point of view and so it's kind of state-controlled media that's kind of how it seems well and, one, one um, thing too i'd bring up too to, is that we've got city councilors with shows on the on there as well yes, so that yes. i think that that kind of makes a little bit more ingrained with our government right. than Councilor that might imply Vidal otherwise the, the anchor of waltham news watch right and former city councilor sari uh sally calora is is also has her long running show on WCAC. Um, there was also a Christo fascist show recently on WCAC by the head of the um, Waltham Republican Party, um, Jim Dixon. I say that because it was called Forgotten Country. It was a whole show about the idea that the US is a Christian country. And um, since we're criticizing them, I want to mention that I actually reached out to the executive director of WCAC two weeks ago. I wrote her an email asking for a phone meeting about an issue we've discussed a lot, which is the uh, recording and captioning of meetings. I did not hear back. I reached out to Justin Barrett about a year and a half ago and did not hear back. So in case anyone is saying, why are they talking about WCAC on their show instead of sitting down and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and working everything out with them? Well, I actually would like to do that. I would love to have a conversation with them about some of the issues we're both covering and, and why they do things certain ways, but they are not interested in that so far. Uh, I would also like to respectfully disagree with Josh and say that Chris Wrangler sucks as a reporter and an editor. <laughs> uh, I, Chris Wrangler, please stop emailing me. I'm not going to respond to any of your emails. Wait, what is he emailing you about? No, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I think some of his stuff is good. His coverage of the market. Well, I was in that, so I'm biased, but his coverage <laughs> of the protests at Market Basket was good. And then it was interesting um, when the, I don't know who wrote what, when there was the school committee meeting about banning the books, there was one article that went up that night and there was another article that went up the day. And the one that went up the next day was really good. It used like, it was very nuanced and used like the right language to talk about both sides. And so uh, that's why, I don't know if he wrote that, but I have seen some some good articles of WCAC. So I just want to be fair since I have a lot of negative things to say as well. He's certainly so, written some articles that I've enjoyed. I'll say that, give him credit. Um, okay, if there's nothing else, we can move on to tenants' rights stuff. Uh, Eamon, I think you're leaving. So thank you for coming on and uh, yeah, well, giving us an office. Thank you. Until next time. Okay, so tenants' rights uh, resolution uh, in the city council this week. We talked. We've been talking about this at length. Tom, please give an update on where we're at. Okay, so yeah, as a broad overview, the tenants' rights tenants' rights notification ordinance is an ordinance that was proposed by Watch CDC, our local like housing and security and assistance organization. Um, which said basically, we want to make sure that all um, renters in Waltham know what resources are available to them. This ordinance that they are proposing would not grant any new rights to tenants, would not cause any uh, cost to the city. It is simply what CDC will provide a piece of paper that lists all the resources that tenants have. So that way tenants, instead of being evicted, they can say like, oh, we have access to this resource program where we can get funds from the government so that way we can keep paying the landlord. The landlord stays happy, the tenant doesn't get evicted, things like that. Um, broadly popular um, advocates for this uh, for this ordinance have been talking behind the scenes, getting support from both renters and landlords. So far, according to ad, uh, advocates who have been involved in this for the past year, the only opposition has been from the city council. Because this was first brought up, or the watch first brought this to the city council a year ago. Um, it sort of like floated around there until last fall, I believe Jonathan Paz submitted it as a resolution. So it's a tenants right notification resolution instead of an ordinance. The difference between an ordinance and resolution being that like the mayor's office has an obligation to uh, carry out an ordinance, but not a resolution. Why Jonathan Paz did that, we don't know. Uh, but regardless, um, that resolution was tabled for so long because no one in city council really cares or is interested in taking this up beyond Jonathan Paz until a few weeks ago when um, Watt CDC housing, their housing advocacy group, tenants rights advocacy group showed up to city council and they got it moved for, uh, off the table and they start discussing the tenants rights notification resolution uh, in city council. Um, Jonathan Paz tried to get um, a chance for tenants to uh, watch CDC members to speak about the bill, um, just like informatively. Um, the chair of the Ordinance and Rules Committee uh, two weeks ago, Kathy Ann Harris, shut that down. She said, nah, but I'm going to send this to the Committee of the Whole, so that way you can discuss it there. Uh, so this past uh, City Council meeting, the Committee of the Whole did discuss this for a whole <laughs> five minutes. In those five minutes, Jonathan Paz or full city council, thank you, not committee of the whole, the full city council. Uh, and they discuss it for a full five minutes because Jonathan Paz stood up. He said, hey, I'm invoking apparently city council rule, 80, rule 88 is what you use uh, to get input from people off the city council, allow them to come up and talk about the whatever you want them to talk about. Jonathan Paz did that. He signed off on every on everything he needed to do to get watch members to talk about this ordinance. Uh, however, um, not far into discussing this, like as soon as Jonathan Paz stopped talking and someone else got to talk, um, Anthony LaFauci stood up and said, hey, um, I'm confused by the fact that this, y'all's language keeps switching between ordinance and resolution because Jonathan submitted as a resolution, but watch first to it as an ordinance. And also, the papers in the middle envelope you, you supplied me uh, aren't all stamped and I don't like that. Um, so I'm gonna invoke rule 26 or section 26 of the Waltham City Charter. And that basically just ends discussion right there. Um, and thus discussion was ended right there. Kathy and Newman 
uh, Truth of Rules said, okay, this is no longer on the table. We're no longer discussing this. I think both Darcy and Jonathan Paz tried to speak up to continue the conversation, but it was over, immediately done. Um, so what's, what section 206 of the charter does is basically um, shuts down discussion immediately. They'll pick it back up next time in two weeks when the full city council meets. So, sorry, James, do you want to? Oh, no, I was just going to say, it's definitely just a delaying tactic at this point. Yeah, so to, to, to give a better understanding why Anthony Fauci did that. So a week before that, at the Ordinance and Rules Committee, this was talked about. Um, we did not discuss last, uh, that meeting on this show. Uh, and in that, Kathy and Harris mentions that the city council members got a packet in their, in their, in their mailbox a folder with everything having to do with uh, uh, the word everything. They got several pages uh, of things having to do with this resolution from I assume watch. Um, now this folder was not put through the usual motions of the city council. I'm assuming actually, I actually don't know if that's true. No, uh, I can confirm that they submitted it to the clerk, city clerk. Huh? The city clerk is who procured these documents in the middle of the envelope to the city council. Like these documents went through the full process uh, and we can link the documents if you just wanna learn more about the ordinance. It's just a few page is explaining, you know, what it is, its background, who the interested parties are, why it's a good uh, thing to implement in Waltham. Um, yeah, no, it, it is what CDC, you're, I'm allowed to say that, you know, what CDC came up, uh, gave this to the city clerk because they're the ones who know everything about it. City clerk tied up the information in a manila envelope deliver that manila envelope to all the city councilors. Um, You're saying that Watch CDC emailed the city clerk, CC, you know, Joe Bizarre, and said, can you distribute these to the full city council? Uh, I don't know if that's exactly how it went down. Uh, but no, they physically deposited the papers in the city clerk's office. Interesting, because... Wow. Okay. I mean, this, might, this might change the, the way I talk about this. Um, but uh, at, at the meeting, they said they got something, they got, they have a folder. Um, it wasn't stamped correctly. Uh, so it wasn't in the, uh, you know, the city council uh, decorum uh, to the way that documents are usually given to them. And, um, and then they, they stamped it right there. Um, and so that's what Anthony Fauci is referring to. He also got this folder and he's saying that because it wasn't done in the decorum that it's usually uh, done with, that he's going to delay this a week um, or two weeks, actually, sorry, um, until the next full city council meeting. Um, and now that's, you know, that's just that's just a delaying tactic, like James said, that's 100 percent delaying tactic. He says that the city, that the committee did not do its due diligence to properly turn this into an ordinance and uh, he wants to uh, delay this two weeks. But the problem with that is that sorry. this whole thing is a delaying tactic, too, because Kathy Ann Harris saying that, oh, we can't take public input in this meeting here for this thing that it's directly about from the organization that submitted it. It instead has to go to this other body. Like mm -hmm. that whole process took also like weeks and of wasting people's time. Mm -hmm. And and at the end of the day, it then gets tabled for another two weeks mm -hmm. because someone has an objection and the reason why it was getting sent back to there was because she said there wasn't support on counts uh, on committee of which there were like you know, <laughs> you know her included you know three other people or something so like she doesn't support it so she sent it back so that no one else would want to talk about it either is what yeah she did. yeah so where where did where could where are they allowed to give public input and also yeah i mean kathy and last week said that this is not the place uh, to hear public input, but they weren't looking for a public input session at the Ordinance and Rules Committee. They were looking for the maker of the resolution to talk about the resolution. They weren't looking for like just like a meeting of the minds at the Ordinance and Rules Committee. It was like the, the expert on tenants' rights in the city was looking to give uh, their input on a resolution on tenants' rights that they themselves uh, authored. It's like that's not that's not a public input session that they were asking for. And Kathy Ann was the one that used that those words. And now she's the one in the city council meeting saying, "Oh, there's broad support. Uh, there's a desire for a public input session." You're the one that said it. You're like, why? It's not. It's you that is, is saying this. Um, yeah. And so, 
And okay, so I've never seen a physical copy of the city council rules of like how it works. So I always just, you know, just follow along. But fortunately, this meeting, when Jonathan paused, since he was bringing this up through Rule 88, which allowed public input, Kathleen McMinnman read the whole Rule 88 to the whole city council. And that confirms that Rule 88 could have easily been used by a member of ordinance and rules to invite a watch member to speak during ordinance and rules during that exact same session at that exact moment. Um, it truly is just the fact that, you know, Waltham City Council as a whole, um, the majority of members are very hostile to renters, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they keep on juggling uh, this ordinance or resolution around uh, mm -hmm. because they're just trying to delay it because they're not interested in protecting the rights of renters. Yeah, no, they're just, yeah, they're 100% just not interested. Going back to Anthony, you know, this is just delaying that. He was talking about, you know, they didn't do their due diligence and, uh, you know, he didn't understand what was in this packet. He got the packet just like everyone else a week ago. And also, this isn't being sent back to the rules and ordinance for them to do their due diligence. This is just going to sit for two weeks and then they're going to do the public input hearing. It's like there's nothing more that's being done. All of his criticisms are still going to be there. You got the freaking packet last week just because it wasn't stamped correctly, which I now can't decide if it was Watch or the city clerk that that is wrong here. Um, like well, nothing's going to change. Watch well, yeah. wouldn't have the stamp, and that would have been yeah, like, yeah, no, no, it's not. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's so weird. Now I don't even yeah. know to think of that. And well, that's weird, but it lines up with kind of the message control that they try to exert on a lot of stuff, where they get mad about their own process not getting followed and use that as an excuse to not do the thing they didn't want to do anyways. Yeah, and also Anthony was like one of the biggest opponents of delaying the farm thing. He was like, and and even even opponents of the delaying of the farm thing can say that at least George Darcy seemed to have merit he thought he had merit even like the worst the worst take would would at least be able to say george thought he was doing something good even though you know i fully agree with george uh, but even this one there's no merit to the delay you got the packet there's no due diligence being done in two weeks why why delay why are we delaying this and i will say i can under he, he also mentioned beyond the stamping which is dumb uh, he also mentioned uh, that he was confused by um, the language of like, you know, both resolution and ordinance was being thrown around, which I understand. Uh, I also don't know why Jonathan Paz made it as a resolution. Uh, but that's a question that Jonathan Paz was ready to answer. And I would have been really curious to hear the answer on. Uh, but he wasn't asking it as a question or as a point of information. He brought it up for the purpose of shutting it down. He's not interested in learning. He's interested in stopping the process. Yeah, no, he's interested in perpetuating the the vibe of the Waltham City Council, which is white homeowners. And that's 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 his agenda, and he's going to use everything in his power to push his agenda. And that's always what he's been about, and what he's going to continue doing. I honestly would not be surprised if you know in two weeks we have another reason being brought up as to not talk about this for another two weeks. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. In two weeks, this is going to be brought up again. Because, yeah, it wasn't pushed back to ordinance and rules. It's just sitting on the council floor. So it's definitely not going to be talked about next week during committee. So in two weeks, we're going to see something happen. So I assume there will be uh, messaging from Watch around this, uh, having people show up uh, for that as well. Um, I might actually return to the city council for the first time in almost a year uh, to actually uh, be a part of that. Sounds interesting. Thank you, Tom, for uh, giving that synopsis. Yeah, of course. Um, now we're going to move on to the Municipal Housing Trust Fund, which no one, oh, you know what? There's plenty of people listening to this that know what the Municipal Housing Trust Fund is. There's plenty of people that don't. So let's, uh, Josh, if you can explain what the Municipal Housing Trust Fund is and why it's relevant in this week's city council. Yeah, so it came up this week because um, there's a special permit application that was introduced in this city council meeting that was then sent to ordinances and rules. And it's a company called Whole Street Partners LLC. They're partnering with the Catholic Church, the, the Cardinal, and they want to uh, rehab a, a former church as 20 units of housing, condos. Um, and it's on Hall Street, which is in the downtown area near Moody, very pretty church, and they want to put 20 units in there. And uh, so they were submitting their application, but part of it was they're asking the council to accept a fee of $1.3 million from these developers to the um, housing uh, trust fund. 
So I looked into this a little more. So uh, Waltham has an ordinance that sets up a housing, affordable housing trust fund. And Waltham has an ordinance that says that if you're developing multifamily homes here, if it's going to have 12 or more units, then at least 20% of the units have to be affordable. Um, affordable meaning they have to be a certain percentage of average median income. So the price is capped, in other words. Um, and, or if you don't want to do that, you can instead pay a fee to the city that is equal to 20% of your budget, your project budget, and that goes into this housing trust fund. So it's an offset for people who uh, are, cannot or don't want to contribute to helping with their housing issue. So uh, this is a city ordinance, but I think it was probably passed in response to 40B and other mass state laws that require us to have a certain percentage of affordable housing. In theory, you could spread that out among all the developers and that could be a fair and effective way to do that, but not if you give them a way out by paying out of it. So 1.3 million is a lot of money. So that raises the question of what do they do with that money? So they want to build 20 units and four of them would have to be affordable. So if this is an offset, if that's the idea behind it, then the city would need to build at least four units somewhere else with that money to make up for it. So is that what they do with it or do, how do they use this money? So one thing we found out that's interesting is uh, there is a board which is chaired by the mayor according to um, the ordinance that establishes it, the um, board of the housing trust and uh, they meet and their meetings are not announced to the public. Um, this docket item referenced that they had voted on this fee at a meeting on April 11th. And we, since you know, we have a volunteer checking the bulletin board of truth, we can confirm that that was not on there. It also was not on the city website. Um, so at first I thought, well, maybe, the, oh, they also don't publish minutes. I wasn't able to find any minutes for their meetings on the website. So at first I thought maybe, well, this is a trust, not a committee. So maybe they have different rules, but oddly in the ordinance that sets it up, it specifically says that they have to uh, follow the public meeting law. So I don't understand why these meetings are not announced to the public and why minutes aren't posted. Um, but we were interested to find out how have they spent, what do they spend this money on? Um, I submitted a request to uh, Clerk Vizard um, to get the records on what they've spent money on for the past 10 years, if he can do that. I haven't heard back, but I only sent it two days ago. So that's fine. Um, but we do have one year's worth of records because as it turns out, uh, Chris has already become interested in this issue two years ago and requested it. So for the year of 2019 to 2020, um, they did spend money on housing. Um, they put $70,000 toward the Fernald Cottage project. And if I understand correctly, that's a hard thing to find info on, but they're taking some of these old cottages at Fernald and they're going to rehab one of them into two units of affordable housing. And this is $70,000. So obviously that doesn't cover the whole budget. I'm not sure where the rest of the money is coming from or why. So they used $70,000 for that in 2020 and they had a remaining balance of $1.5 five million. Um, so when I asked around, people seem to remember that the last time they spent money from it on housing was about 10 years ago when they did the Hardy School and Bank School were, were turned into housing. Um, I can't, so that would mean other than the 70K for Fernal, they haven't spent any money on housing, new housing in 10 years. I can't confirm that until I got the records um, from the city clerk. But this really suggests maybe a kind of a broken system because you're asking people to pay to offset sort of damage they're doing to the community by not helping with our affordable housing. And then the money is not necessarily being used to offset it. So hopefully we'll find out more about this. This particular project is interesting. They're going to, um, it is, uh, the company that is partnering um, with the church to do this is called um, Hill Street Partners, Hall Street Partners, excuse me, LLC. And when there's an LLC, you can't look up everyone who's part of it. There's one person who's the public contact and the public contact, contact on this LLC is Ron Sincata Jr., who is Mayor McCarthy's cousin. Um, he is not related to our loyal fan and uh, appreciator, uh, Carl Sincata. There are at least two different Sincata families in Waltham from different 
Italian American immigrants. So Ron Sincata is not related to Carl Sincata, but he is related to Mayor McCarthy, and he's one of the people working on this project. So we'll be interested to find out more about this project as it goes through the special permit process, but we're also interested to find out more about this housing trust because uh, you know, between this and the CPC money, there's a lot of, there's millions of dollars available to be spent on creating new housing in Waltham. And we have created small amounts of new housing over the years, but the amount we're creating is not enough to really address our housing crisis. And it seems like there are a lot of missed opportunities. So this, this could be another example of that. So yeah, during that meeting, um, during the full city council, the special permit hearing was like an hour and a half. Um, uh, one comment that I found interesting was Sean Durkee, who often on the show, um, I, I paint in a bad light. So I definitely um, wanted to give him credit where credit is due uh, to show a clip of uh, him addressing kind of that kind of that question of, you know, we have the municipal housing trust fund gets one point three million dollars um, instead of building uh, four units of affordable housing. But the city can't you can't create four affordable units uh, in the city using $1.3 million. Like that's impossible. Um, and so I definitely want to include that clip here. These, these condos. I believe they'll start in the 800s. 800s. Yeah. So For the smaller units. My, my concern is, you know, we, we had 20% of uh, affordable housing for for development and b by getting a payment in lieu of if i'm not mistaken we will be will fall behind i know it's only four units but we'll be even further behind and even with all the current buildings going up 40b developments uh we still won't be at the 10 percent threshold so these units will be built somewhere else in the city and my understanding and correct me if i'm wrong there's there's three ways of of um taking care of this this problem. You can set aside 20% of the units. You can do a payment in lieu of as you're doing, or you can just purchase offsite um, housing somewhere else. And my concern is that the, and again, I know this is a recommendation. This isn't something you came up with. Um, but if we were, to, if the city had to buy four units, there would be a hell of a lot more than $1.3 million. And I'm just, I'm just saying this for the just as much for the public and the rest of the council. I, I don't want to be on the, I don't want to do what happened in the past where we just took a payment and we get further behind because we will never, ever catch up. And so I definitely wanted, uh, I, I thought that was a, a great comment um, from Sean Durkee. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, in 2020, um, I, I, you know, I had heard whispers about Municipal Housing Trust Fund uh, from other people, but like, it began, I became really interested in the idea of like, we have millions of dollars in this account that we're, that can build affordable housing. And like, we're in a city that just like doesn't have enough of it, according to every uh, metric available. Um, and, and so I, uh, yeah, I asked uh, Joe Bizarre for, uh, the money in that and in the CPA funds. Funny you mentioned that because in that uh, public requ request, I asked for that as well. And yeah, there's millions and millions of dollars. Like, and we're not just we're just doing nothing with it. We're just not building affordable housing. And it just it just blew me away. I mean, every it's all it's tied together to every everything we're everything we're talking about. Um, at the ordinance and rules last uh, week, the single family zoning, uh, the 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 sanctity of the single family zoning resolution uh, was. Was talked about again we've covered that extensively but we're looking to like codify into law what single family zoning means and this is all to essentially to push out students uh that rent in these single family zoning uh zoned uh areas of waltham to protect the sanctity of the people that are, are using that and so that was in ordinance and rules uh last week and they're really getting to a point that they're now going to bring into the full city council um uh, or it's committee of the whole, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Um, and they want to go into executive session to talk about, uh, the, the repercussions of, um, landlords and, uh, real estate agents that, that do not follow the law, um, which is, uh, you know, they have to define what that is. And so, you know, uh, this isn't really what I want to talk about. Uh, I have other points to make, but again, just addressing the, the slippery slope because in the ordinance and rules committee, he talked about how uh, a lawyer talked about um, the definition of single family zoning is like, 
traditional single families. And so what, what is the word traditional? At, at a time where LGBT rights are, you know, uh, being disrupted in the, in the country, we're now going to attempt to codify into law what a traditional family means. Um, not even to get into the discussion of, of what this means for polyamorous people, because on paper, they're just three, four people living together, three, four plus um, people living together. And under this, uh, if we codify this into law, they will, it is literally going to be illegal for them to live together. Um, and Karen Dunn have brought up the, the good example of, okay, well, what if students uh, exist together um, in a single family zone, you know, they they go to school, they, they come home and they, you know, go to bed and they wake up and nothing and uh, they don't do anything about it. No, they just, that would be illegal uh, in this new, um, in this new codification. And so that is going through the motion. And so those students are going to be pushed out of their, that housing as well. So even the, the bare minimum housing that's already in Waltham for students is going to be dwindled. And coupled with the fact that Brandeis just botched their housing uh, lottery. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but during their housing lottery, the rising sophomores um, did not even the rising sophomores got all the housing that they needed. And it's not even taking into account all of the juniors and all of the seniors. And so more than ever before, any other year, uh, Brandeis students get screwed on their housing lottery. And so now there's going to be even more students that are being pushed out into the Waltham uh, housing uh, community um, looking for opportunities. Uh, and there's going to be even less of them. Um, and so everyone's looking for housing and Waltham is just not building it. And, and so any, and, and, and it's all connected. We're, we're even talking about the MTA's Communities Act. Even the state is like, you guys just aren't building enough housing. It's insane how little housing you guys have here. Let's, let's, this is exactly what you have to do. You have to rezone for this amount. And then like, maybe, maybe that'll be enough housing for everyone to have housing and for rents to go down. And the, the city of Waltham, instead of being like, okay, like maybe, maybe you have a point. They are going apeshit. Worse than I've ever seen it. They are going to drag their feet on building any affordable uh, rezoning. Not even, they're not even building it. They're just, uh, just uh, being allowed. They're just against being allowed uh, developers to build. Um, and so, I mean, it's all just, it's all connected. It's all fucked. And Waltham is just so screwed in affordable housing and on tenants' rights. And there's just very little representation. And uh, yeah, I, it's, I get so pessimistic thinking about it. Um, sorry for going on pessimistic rant there. Does anyone have anything else they want to talk about before we end this show? Um, I was going to say something related to the uh, well, related to the pessimistic rant, and it's just like the <clears throat> it, it sort of there's been like a lot of situations lately where things that are in favor of by like you know ninety percent of the people, yet opposed by a specific small minority, somehow always seems to have everything procedural bend to the that minority getting exactly what they wanted and it's not you know a coincidence and it's not conspiratorial really it's just them getting what they want and yeah, they figured continue it to out. happen yeah they figured it out i mean it took i mean i'm sure it took decades of slowly you know getting into these positions but they figured out how to, how to live a good life and you know they those 500 families that i talked about they're living a good life in waltham good for them but the, it's also kind of shows screwed. it's like you know kind of a confession as to like you know they, they feel like it's a zero-sum game and if they give up any power then people are going to take away stuff as aggressively as they did to other people and yeah that kind of shows where they're coming from yeah i well, saw so there this is a big issue at brandeis now and i was reading some of there's some accounts on instagram talking about it there's been protests and one of the accounts estimated, I don't know how they came up with this number exactly, but they said at this made it there are 600 students who were expecting to live on campus in the fall who now can't and have to find housing in Waltham or nearby. 600, that's a lot of people looking for housing. Um, and, and 
also they said they they said there were about 30 students who had disabilities and asked for accommodations and were told no. So now there are something like 30 students with disabilities who have to find the right kind of housing for them in the community. Um, so this is a big deal and it's a big deal at Brandeis and it's basically, it's just an amazing disconnect that there's the same issue as being discussed at Brandeis and in City Hall and neither of them is really treating it like we need more housing for the students. Our city is treating it like we need rules to keep them out of our housing. <laughs> and it's like, and we don't know really exactly what Brandeis, you know, what, what Brandeis's position on it is. But uh, it's been, you know, the students have been saying since last year, they've been trying to raise the issue that Brandeis routinely admits more people, more students than it has housing for. And this time it really apparently became more obvious that now a lot more students are paying attention. Um, but it's just, it's so frustrating to see the same issue happening in both places where they could help each other, but they're not going to because the people making the decisions that's it's not their interest to create new housing. They're ideologically opposed to it is what it comes down to. They view it, any new housing is inherently bad and not going to be a positive contribution and anything that supports like further commercial development and pulling in drivers, specifically drivers from outside of the city as the only thing worth investing in. That just is what they do. And a, a partnership between the city and Brandeis could be really helpful in complying with MBTK Immunities Act in a positive way because the Brandeis T area is one of the areas um, that needs to have multifamily housing. And it can't be student only housing because it has to be for everyone. But Brandeis could collaborate with Waltham to create zoning and then create housing that's for everyone but is affordable to students. And that would be really cool, right? To have a neighborhood that's a mix of students and local people and then have like businesses and stuff there. And like people would love to be able to you know, go hang out in the college -y part of town, right? But that's just right now with the people we have on the council and in the mayor's office that we're not even close to making those. Oh, that sounds like a nightmare to that, a lot that of sounds people. like Cambridge <laughs> is what you're describing. They don't want Cambridge. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, they should, they, they that want to keep a easy. sharp dividing line between the suburbs and where the college kids are. Yeah. And, but what you said is not unprecedented. Uh, Boston, while this isn't like the solution that you were describing, has a first step called the University Accountability Ordinance which basically in Boston, they have a lot of universities. The universities report to them the number of students they're letting in, the amount of housing they have it in, so that way the city can work off of that. So it's like, it's not unprecedented. Like this is, all well, is probably the first city to deal with the problem. And there are first steps. Um, but as y'all have mentioned, Waltham is not taking those first steps. Waltham is, Waltham city government is lashing out and just making it harder for people to find homes. And just to reemphasize the stakes of this, the result of people not having homes is not is sometimes people cramming into dorms and sometimes people cramming into apartments. But eventually, the actual end result is they become unhoused. That is the stakes of this argument. Um, these policies cause people to lose their homes, housing instability, um, and it's a disaster that takes forever to dig yourself out of. Yeah, we talked about it uh, at, a, at an earlier show, but the um, single family zoning codification, you know, it's targeting uh, houses that house three, four students. Uh, but the reality is there are so many houses in Waltham that house three, four adults, three, four families. And so all of them would be pushed out of single family zoning. Um, it's just, it, that is dystopian. And what that also means is if there are enough families violating the ordinance that the, the, the city can't enforce against all of them, then they have to select selectively enforce. Mm -hmm. And that means that opens the door to just pick and choose who we want to have living here. And, I mean, if we're going off of like, you know, how our city meetings seem to run, selective enforcement is what we can expect. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's, that's kind of what they were asking for at the beginning in the early discussions about it. They were saying, why can't you just, you know, go to these houses and say you can't have this many people here? And, and the building inspector actually said that. He said, I can't selectively enforce. If you want me to enforce an ordinance, you have to give me an ordinance I can enforce on everyone. Okay, uh, this has been a good show. Uh, so thank you, uh, everyone, for coming on and chatting. Thanks for listening. Um, we'll be back next week uh, to chat.
for pe folks who are concerned about the fernal development, there is now a petition. Um, it's starting to get some traction. That is a first step to try to stop this plan, which the mayor seems very dead set on. Um, but we'll put a link to that petition. So if you're concerned about that issue, uh, please check out that. And additionally, if you're concerned about uh, renters' rights and you want to make sure people don't get evicted, that renters are made aware of their rights, um, Watch CDC has formed a petition in support of it, which we can also link. Please fill that out. And also please email uh, your city councilors about the issue, telling them you support the passage of the tenant's rights notification ordinance. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Thanks, everyone. everyone.